that's why you weren't able to find your way in. So we'll start. Oh, 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 Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahano Bunaktu Sahavir Yang Karava Bahai Tejasvina Vadita Mastu Mavid Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace. Peace be unto us, to all beings everywhere. May the divine being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the divine being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace. So we are studying chapter four of Swami Vivekananda's Jnana Yoga, uh, strong stuff. Uh, after you've had a, after you had a chance to uh, to uh, think about what was said and read last week, um, any questions or comments that you'd like to make before we start? about this rather powerful talk by Swamiji. Okay, I'll start here. Vedanta shows the way out. You must bear in mind that I have to tell you facts that will frighten you sometimes. But if you remember what I say, think of it and digest it, it will be yours. If you remember what I say, think of it and digest it, it will be yours. It will raise you higher and make you capable of understanding and living in truth. Now there's one of those promises that these great ones make. He's saying, if you'll make the effort to understand and digest what I've said, it will make you capable of living, of understanding and living in truth. Now it is a statement of fact that this world is a Tantalus's hell, that we do not know anything about this universe, yet at the same time, we cannot say that we do not know. I cannot say that this chain, I cannot say that this chain exists when I think that I do not know it. It may be an entire delusion of my brain. I may be dreaming all the time. I am, <clears throat> I am dreaming that I am talking to you and that you are listening to me. I'm gonna repeat that. We do not know anything about this universe. Yet at the same time, we cannot say that we do not know. I cannot say that this chain exists when I think that I do not know it. It may be an entire delusion of my brain. I may be dreaming all the time. I am dreaming that I am talking to you and that you are listening to me. No one can prove that it is not a dream. My brain itself may be a dream. 
And as to that, no one has ever seen his own brain. We all take it for granted. So it is with everything. My own body, I take for granted. At the same time, I cannot say I do not know. This standing between knowledge and ignorance, this mystic twilight, the mingling of truth and falsehood, and where they meet, no one knows. We are walking in the midst of a dream, half sleeping, half waking, passing all our lives in a haze. This is the fate of every one of us. This is the fate of all sense knowledge. This is the fate of all philosophy, of all boasted science, of all boasted human knowledge. This is the universe. Now, I cannot think that what the Swami just said hasn't given rise to some thoughts or comments or questions because of how powerfully he said it. I'll be happy to read it again if you think that would be useful. Uh, I will be happy to address any comments or questions that you have. All right. Could you please read it again? All right. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Was that Katrina? President. Yes. Thank you, Katrina. Now, it is a statement of fact that this world is a Tantalus's hell. If you, if you want to know the meaning of Tantalus's hell, just think about the word tantalize. Uh, the fact that you, something is just out of reach. It tantalizes you, but you can't quite get it. That was Tantalus's fate. Now, it is a statement of fact that this world is a Tantalus's hell, that we do not know anything about this universe, yet at the same time, we cannot say that we do not know. I cannot say that this chain exists when I think that I do not know it. It may be an entire delusion of my brain. I may dream, be dreaming all the time. I am dreaming that I am talking to you and that you are listening to me, no one can prove that it is not a dream. My brain itself may be a dream. And as to that, no one has ever seen his own brain. We all take it for granted. So it is with everything. My own body I take for granted. At the same time, I cannot say, I do not know. This standing between knowledge and ignorance, this mystic twilight, the mingling of truth and falsehood and where they meet, no one knows. We are walking in the midst of a dream, half sleeping, half waking, passing all our lives in a haze. This is the fate of every one of us. This is the fate of all sense knowledge. This is the fate of all philosophy, of all boasted science, of all boasted human knowledge. This is the universe. Any comments or questions? So the Swami is saying this universe is just a dream? He's saying that no one can prove it is not. In another place, he says, we are infinite dreamers dreaming finite dreams. We are infinite dreamers dreaming finite dreams. So he's, he's saying that, he's saying that we cannot through our sense knowledge, our intellectual knowledge know this universe 
what he's going to say next is follows on the statement that opened this reading, which is Vedanta shows the way out. So yes, Pramadas, he's saying that we, we're dreaming. So, Brother Shankara? Yes. So, I wonder, where, where does faith start and where does knowledge, knowledge end? Because Vivekananda also says that, and many other saints say that if man had more faith in themselves, then much of the evils of the world would be gone. Well, evils of the world is a whole other matter. But where does faith begin? Faith begins with experience. Faith begins with doing enough spiritual work to where you begin to have the experience of what exists within you. Uh, before that, you may have a working faith. Uh, you take a stand for the truths that are spoken by the saints, by the scriptures, by the avatars. You have a working faith in which you say, based on my working faith, I'll make the self-effort, the Purushakara, I'll make the self-effort required to have the experience that will give me real faith. Because once you have these experiences of what exists within you, then you are very clear that that is a truth it is it it is reliable it exists and furthermore it is superior in quality and uh, substance to your experiences gained through the senses the mind and the intellect Very, very good question. Thanks for asking it, Sunny. Um, Brother Shankara? So I am. So I, I think the, the I that he's using in all of these paragraphs, um, he's referring to his form and name, Swami Vivekananda. Is he going to pivot on this point in this chapter or? Well, uh, that's where that's where we're headed next. <laughs> but yes, he's speaking of the he's speaking of the uh, of the name and form Vivekananda. But of course, Vivekananda as a name and form is somewhat different than ourselves, um, because he's speaking from capital K knowledge and from a faith that. Uh, we could only hope to uh, and aspire to uh, attain a fraction of. It would be enough if we had a fraction of his faith, because it would it would uh, result in savikalpa samadhi. Good question, Swayam. Any anything else from anyone? Yes, uh, Brother Shankara. Yes. I think um, a really important thing is that he opens by saying it is a statement of fact. Mm -hmm. And so it's true that from the perspective of facts, things are, you know, can be illusory. But, uh, but there are things that are more primordial than facts. No, I mean, the, I think he's, when we reduce being to a set of facts, then Yes, everything is is illusory. Um, but uh, it, it's it's um, if if we don't do that, I mean, the world may be a dream, but it's a real dream. Uh, um, from one perspective, it's a real dream. From the perspective of the experience, once you once you have gained the perspective. Of the in, of inner knowledge, of, of what comes from penetrating the veil of Maya, 
then you see, yes, this is what Sri Ramakrishna calls vigyana, special knowledge. So yes, you see that uh, as, as Sri Ramakrishna put it, the dream is just the water in waves. That which is dreaming is the water still. The, the water still is the, is the Atman or Brahman. The water in waves is Shakti or Maya. But one cannot jump from one point of view to the other. One cannot say, oh, well, this also is real. You first have to question its reality enough to say, I have been told and any number of saints and avatars incarnations have told me that the real treasure is within. And so perhaps I'll be inspired to make the effort to find what is within. Then I will understand in a way that is not available to us before then what we're seeing and experiencing um, through our senses and through our mind and our intellect. It becomes a ripe ego, a pure mind, a pure intellect. The mirror of the heart is wiped clean. So it reflects accurately. Very, very well said, Alex. But it, uh, what it leads us is where the Swami is headed next. So that doesn't mean we shouldn't pause for any other comments or questions. I mean, we need to build on a, a solid understanding of what he said so far, which is what this is, this comments and questions is about. Anything else before we read on? All right. What you call matter or spirit or mind or anything else, you may like to call them, the fact remains the same. What you call matter or spirit or mind or anything else you may like to call them, the fact remains the same. We cannot say that they are. We cannot say that they are not. We cannot say they are one. We cannot say they are many. This eternal play of light and darkness, indiscriminate, indistinguishable, inseparable, is always there. A fact, yet at the same time not a fact. Awake and at the same time asleep. This is a statement of facts, and this is what is called Maya. We are born in this Maya. We live in it. We think in it. We dream in it. We are philosophers in it. We are spiritual men in it. Nay, we are devils in this Maya, and we are gods in this Maya. Stretch your ideas as far as you can. Stretch your ideas as far as you can, make them higher and higher, call them infinite or by any other name you please. Even these ideas are within this Maya. It cannot be otherwise. And the whole of human knowledge is a generalization of this Maya, trying to know it as it appears to be. This is the work of Namarupa, name and form. Is everybody familiar with the idea of Namarupa? 
Nama Rupa is what enables us to have any idea, name and form. Just to give you an example, if you transported a refrigerator and a generator to run it into the jungles of unexplored New Guinea, there are still places in New Guinea where such places exist. If you, if you transported this refrigerator and the generator into that jungle, the people there would have no idea what in the world this was. They might not even see it. They might not even see it in the way we think of seeing. Because they have no knowledge of it in the sense of name and form. We make our universe. We project the universe in which we live out of our knowledge of name and form. This incredible machine that we inhabit, and it is an incredible machine. By incredible, I mean, if you ponder on it, you simply can't believe that it, it, the truth of it. It makes of nothing but vibration, which is what is surrounds us. Hmm? The physicists have got this just nailed. You don't have to believe the Vedas or, or, or Krishna or, or me. Just read the work of Don Lincoln, the head of Fermilab. There's nothing outside of us but vibration, nothing. We ourselves are vibration, nothing else. And mostly empty space in which this vibration is taking place. And yet this incredible machine because of this phenomenon of the knowledge of name and form makes of that vibration the world in which, as this Swami says, we dream this dream of finitude. Out of the infinite universe, and, and this is what Don Lincoln of Fermilab says, Every one of these fields of vibration is infinite. And if any one part of it vibrates, it all vibrates. Einstein said the same thing. So this incredible machine is a creator of our reality based on nama rupa, name and form. We know the names of things and we know their felt forms and we can generalize them. Once we've really understood a uh, table, we can recognize any kind of table. Once we recognize pot, we can recognize any kind of pot. Any, because this is so fundamental, are there any questions or comments about this business of Nama Rupa and our dependence on it for projecting the, our individual universe and our limited knowledge as, as the Swami says of the infinite universe. Anything at all? Well, it seems to me like um, what Emerson said, every heart beats on an iron string. And it's as though when you give something a name, say that wave rising from the ocean, you give it a name. It's like you identify a certain point 
in the vibration. And then once you identify it as such, you're able to recognize when that vibration comes again. Mm -hmm. or, or, or a similar vibration. Yeah, so like a pot or something related, you would say like, a, you know, some, some, something close to a pot, but not a pot. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, so you have different. Well, you have a pot, you have a colander, you have a bowl, you have a plate. Exactly, all exactly. Of things, all of these things are variations on a theme, but we know those variations. Thank you, Divya. Any, anything else from anyone? The Swami said he'd startle us, and I think he has. <laughs> Everybody's kind of startled into a little, little bit of silence. But as long as you're clear that this capability of name and form is what allows us to participate in Maya. Brother Shaka, this is Katrina. Yes. Um, Katrina. I just want to make, make sure. So he's saying that when, when I can name something, then the fact that I can name it or, or the fact that I name, then naming then impacts the vibration and then- No, no, that... no, 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 Katrina, it's not that way around. Okay. The, the, it, 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 yes, it impacts the vibration. That's a whole other conversation though. Um, okay. your, your, your awareness of something uh, uh, can be transmitted to another person uh, miles away uh, but that, that's not what the Swami is talking about here he's saying that the reality that your body mind complex your chitta hmm, your mind stuff. The reality that is created by that mind stuff is made up of these vibrations called vritti. And as long as we can know the vritti's name and form, then we, we can deal with it. If, if something came into our awareness for which we did not know the, the name and form of that vibration, <laughs> there are, there's a lot of argument to be said that it's going on all around us all the time. There's lots of vibration that we don't sense because we're not sufficiently sensitive to it. This is described in the powers section, chapter three of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. Hmm. What do, how we can increase our psychic sensitivity and become aware of much more going on around us because we, through concentration, um, samyama is the term learn to recognize things that were hitherto unknown to us. But it's still all name and form. Everything within time, space, and causation is name and form. Okay, thank you. Yes, that doesn't mean you don't have an impact. On, on what's going on. When you vibrate, according to Albert Einstein, when you, your mind vibrates, when you vibrate, the whole universe vibrates. So okay. but that's, another, that's another conversation. Okay. Anything else from anyone? This is startling stuff. There's no two ways about it. My brother Shankara? 
Yes. I think you went into it a little bit, but I'm just wondering, how do you explain the spiritual concept of vibration when we can't perceive it? And I don't know if there's a full scientific basis for it or, or is there, is there a scientific basis from which we can explain the concept of vibration to another person? Well, just read the work of Don Lincoln, uh, the head of Fermilab. You can find his work online. That's where I found it. And then go and read, uh, just do a, do a Google search for the sage Vashishta's explanation to Rama that everything that he experiences, he Rama, everything that exists in the sense of uh, experience is nothing more than a vibration of consciousness. So very interesting research has been recently done by a man named Pim Van Lammel, Dr. Pim Van Lammel, about uh, putting people in what are called Faraday cages that isolate them from all electromagnetic radiation. And he puts one person in a, in a Faraday cage here and then another person in a Faraday cage several kilometers away and they can still communicate with one another. Something that is not electromagnetic is happening. And he asserts that uh, it falls in this category of a vibration of consciousness, not a vibration of something within time, space, and causation. Who is, who is the second person in conversation to Rama? Vashishta, V-A-S-I, S-T-H-A, Vashishta. Vashishta, okay, thank you. Yeah, Vashishta's yoga, Vashishta's, uh, the yoga Vashishta is 30,000 shlokas of uh, instruction by the sage Vashishta to Rama over uh, three days time. And it has many startling uh, things Anything else from anyone? This is good. This is what we're supposed to do. This is how we study the art of spirituality together by uh, surfacing these concerns and, and thoughts. Um, <clears throat> I, I think it's really interesting. The, the point that he makes about the brain itself being an illusion, I think is very interesting because I think that the brain can be a sort of sticking point for people who um, have a materialist worldview where they reduce everything to brain processes. Yes. And uh, they say, well, everything that we experience, even the love that you feel is nothing but an illusion created by the brain. But then they don't realize that their experience of the brain is also then within the realm of experience and therefore they can't say where it comes from because yeah, they're chasing if they say that it comes from the brain, then it's a, in itself it's a circle, right. yeah, logic. They're, they're chasing their tails, but they don't know it, yes. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an infinite regression, what they, what they uh, and, and the, the Swami remarked on that, and, or uh, it gave it a side swipe earlier on. Okay. Everything that has form, everything that calls up an idea in your mind is within Maya. For everything that is bound by the laws of time, space, and causation is within Maya. Let us go back a little to those early, those early ideas of God and see what, has be what became and see what became of them. We perceive at once that the idea of 
some being who is eternally loving us, eternally unselfish and almighty, ruling this universe, could not satisfy. Where is the just, merciful God? asked the philosopher. Does he not see millions and millions of his children perish in the form of men and animals, men and women and animals? For who can live one moment here without killing others? Can you draw breath without destroying thousands of lives? You live because millions die. Every moment of your life, every breath that you breathe is death to thousands. Every movement that you make is death to millions. Every morsel that you eat is death to millions. Why should they die? There is an old sophism that they are very low existences. There is an old sophism, sophism, uh, philosophical idea. Um, that they are very low existences. Supposing they are, which is questionable, for who knows whether the ant is greater than the man or the man than the ant, who can prove one way or the other? Apart from that question, even taking it for granted that these are very low beings, Still, why should they die? If they are low, they have, more, they have more reason to live. Why not? Because they live more in the senses. They feel pleasure and pain a thousandfold more than you or I can do. Which of us eats a dinner with the same gusto as a dog or a wolf? None because our energies are not in the senses. They are in the intellect, in the spirit. But in animals, their whole soul is in the senses. And they become mad and even, they become mad and enjoy things which, human, which we human beings never dream of. And the pain is commensurate with the pleasure. Pleasure and pain are meted out in equal measure. If the pleasure felt by animals is much keener than that felt by man, it follows that the animal's sense of pain is as keen, if not keener, than man's. So the fact is, the pain and misery men feel in dying. That was my son calling about the election, no doubt. So the fact is, the pain and misery men feel in dying is intensified a thousandfold in animals, and yet we kill them without troubling ourselves about their misery. This is Maya. And if we suppose there is a personal God like a human being who made everything, these so-called explanations and theories which try to prove that out of evil comes good are not sufficient. Let 20,000 do good things. Well, oh, I'm sorry, let 20,000 good things come, but why should they come from evil? On that principle, I might cut the throats of others because I want the full pleasure of my five senses. That is no reason. Why should good come through evil? The question remains to be answered, and it cannot be answered. The philosophy of India was compelled to admit this. The Vedanta was and is the oldest system of religion. It stopped nowhere, and it had one advantage. There was no body of priests who sought to suppress every man who tried to tell the truth. There was always absolute religious freedom. In India, the bondage of superstition is a social one. Here in the West, society is very free. Social matters in India are very strict, <clears throat> but religious opinion is free. In England, 
a man may dress any way he likes or eat what he likes. No one objects. But if he misses attending church, then Mrs. Grundy is down on him. He has to come, he has to conform first to what society says on religion. And then he may think of the truth. In India, on the other hand, if a man if a man dines with one who does not belong to his own caste, down comes society with all its terrible powers and crushes him then and there. If he wants to dress a little differently from the way in which his ancestor dressed ages ago, he is done for. I have heard of a man who was cast out by society because he went several miles to see the first railway train. Well, we shall presume that is not that was not true. But in religion, we find atheists, materialists, and Buddhists, creeds, opinions, and speculations of every play, of every phase and variety, some of a most startling character, living side by side. Preachers of all sects go about preaching and getting adherents. And, the very, and at the very gates of the temples of gods, the Brahmins, to their credit, be it said, allow even the materialists to stand and give forth their opinions. So the Swami is telling us that we must be free of this superstitious belief that religion can be contained, that one religion or some system of religious thought is the way to think and be. And yet we know that there are people in this society, the society of the United States where we're living, who would, if they could, enforce their spiritual tradition on you or condemn you to death. So that didn't, that didn't, uh, that didn't end in the time that just because another century or so has passed. So any, any other comments or questions before I go on? Okay, Buddha died at a ripe old age. I remember a friend of mine, a great American scientist, who was fond of reading his life. He did not like the death of Buddha because he was not crucified. What a false idea. For a man to be great, he must be murdered. Such ideas never prevailed in India. This great Buddha traveled all over India, denouncing her gods and even the God of the universe. And yet he lived to a good old age. For 80 years he lived and had converted half the country. Then there were the Charvakas who preached horrible things, the most rank misguided materialism, such as in the 19th century, they dare not openly preach. So 
he's comparing and contrasting the the uh, Buddhists with the Charvakas who preached horrible things, the most rank, undisguised materialism, such as in the 19th century, the century that the Swami was speaking in, they dare not openly preach. These Charvakas were allowed to preach from temple to temple and city to city, that religion was all nonsense, that it was priestcraft, that the Vedas were the words and writings of fools, rogues, and demons, and that there was neither God nor an eternal soul. If there was a soul, why did it not come back after death, uh, drawn by the love of wife and child? Their idea was that if there was a soul, it was, it was at most, if there was a soul, it must still love after death and want good things to eat and nice dress. Yet no one hurt these charvakas. Thus India has always had this magnificent idea of religious freedom. And you must remember that freedom is the first condition of growth. What you do not make free will never grow. The idea that you can make others grow and help their growth, that you can direct and guide them, always retaining for yourself the freedom of the teacher, is nonsense, a dangerous lie which has retarded the growth of millions and millions of human beings in this world. Let men have the right of liberty. That is the only condition of growth. <clears throat> the Swami has said so much and promised so much in the name of Vedanta. We've got 12 minutes left in this evening's class. Is there anyone who would like to make any remark or ask any question based on what the Swami's been saying? The Swami says that the Buddha traveled all over India denouncing gods and even the God of the universe. I didn't see any evidence that Buddha denounced gods. He just said, this is the Eightfold Path to Liberation. Was oh. there evidence that Buddha actually denounced the gods and the God of the universe? Yes, and but it wasn't as if he went about um, actively denouncing. He was just saying, don't be thinking that way to those people who thought that way because it won't profit you anything. You have to, and as you say, he taught the fourfold truths and the Eightfold Path for forward, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. This is what he taught, uh, but he dismissed, I, I would use the word dismissed rather than denounced, but uh, who am I to argue with Swamiji? He knows his Buddhism much better than I do. Um, my reading of what the Buddha did was that he dismissed the um, worship of the gods and uh, for that matter, Ishwara, uh, the god of the universe, um, or Ishwari, uh, and said, all this is just wasting your time. Uh, it isn't going to solve the problem of suffering. First, you have to acknowledge the suffering and so on, the Four Noble Truths. 
then then you have to uh, and and he did put it in a in a way of if you're going to end suffering this is what you have to do and he was dismissive of uh, other kinds of efforts and as Vivekananda pointed out he converted half the country which it was already you know a sizable population um, so much so that the uh, the priests were in a panic because uh, and, and accused the Buddha of destroying society and civilization because so many people were becoming monastics Buddhist Buddhist monastics to follow his way and not so, participate in the heart attack machine. So why did Buddhism ultimately fail in India? And was that a good thing that it failed? Uh, um, Dr. Suzuki, you may know the name Dr. Suzuki was a great, uh, I'm not remembering his first name right now, but he was a friend of Swami Prabhavananda's. Um, and he came and spoke to the Swami over lunch one day and he said, the problem with Buddhism is that it has no heart. Um, by that he meant the narrow path, the, the uh, Hinayana Buddhism uh, that is most strictly adheres to the Buddha's actual teachings. And uh, Vivekananda said the reason that it ultimately failed is because it, ha it gave no uh, scope for bhakti for devotion mm. that's that's what Vivekananda says you At can find time, you know, oh, sorry. no no please go ahead sorry um at the same time though he I don't think he himself gives up on Buddhism and in fact he says uh and I think Sri Ramakrishna also does he said Buddha is a god and Hindus believe that he is God. So Buddhism still lives on through Hinduism. And in the essay, uh, Buddhism is the fulfillment of Hinduism that he, or the, sorry, the talk that he delivered. He says, I'm not a Buddhist, as you have heard, and yet I am. And so there is this sense that uh, he says the relation of the Buddha to the Hindus is similar to the relation of Christ to the Jews. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that really helpful, except that, of course, the, you know, Christ was crucified partially by his own people, but the Buddha, the Hindus finally accepted him as, um, as God, because otherwise Hinduism wouldn't be Hinduism. Yes. Well, it's that, that idea of religious tolerance and freedom. Um, yes, there's a lot of murkiness about all of these uh, prior teachers. I mean, um, the, but the, 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 it's, it's very clear what the Buddha's basic teachings were. And there are millions of adherents uh, of the narrow path and the big, little boat, the Hinayana, and the big boat, Mahayana. Um, Dr. Suzuki, the friend of Swami Prabhupada, ultimately became a Mahayana Buddhist because of the uh, because of the scope for worship. And yes, uh, Sri Ramakrishna and uh, and um, Vivekananda are in agreement that the Buddha was indeed an incarnation of the divine presence. I mean, I, I remember Swamiji also said that the Buddha was the greatest representation of karma, karma yoga. Yeah, he was the greatest karma yogi, yes. Yeah, which is, it seems kind of counterintuitive that he, sa he sacrificed so much, yet they're saying that he wasn't, he didn't, um, as you said, devote to bhakti yoga. But well, the, the Buddha's realization, as, as seems to be the case for each of the great world teachers, was appropriate for its time. 
I mean, there was a great deal of out and out priestcraft in uh, the Buddha's time. The priests were manipulating people for their own purposes and telling them that they had to go through uh, the priests uh, because just as the Catholic Church did say, you know, you have to have the intercessor, uh, we'll sell you uh, salvation, <clears throat> uh, indulgences, and so on. Um, so it, this is, priestcraft is nothing new. It, it, it arises and subsides, arises and subsides. And it usually arises uh, just before <laughs> one of the great teachers comes to uh, to put it back in its place I mean if you go right now if you if you I, I shouldn't say right now because I don't know about right now I went to the Kaligat temple in uh, in uh, Calcutta in 1999 and was absolutely assailed by the priests there to give donations. I mean, assailed, just set upon. I'm not pointing a finger or saying anything was wrong. It's just, it was just a fact. That didn't happen in Varanasi, by the way. It was interesting how different it was. Anything else? I just wanted to, Brother Shankar, this is Naveen, Haryom. Yes, Haryom Naveen. Just wanted to add that some most of these confusions comes out when we try to see or understand Hinduism with any ism. These, all these isms are the, which we call in Hindi, we call pant, like uh, path. Mm -hmm. They are all started by somebody mm -hmm. and people followed them. Hinduism, which is actually called Sanatan Dharma is not that ism started by one person. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, the, the, as has been said many times, Naveen, you're absolutely right. right. Hinduism, the very term is an invention of the British. And it was yes. a, it was a, 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 a an objectification of their laziness. They yes. didn't want to think about uh, Sanatana Dharma and, the, and not let alone the six uh, darshanas, let alone the, the many other aspects, the paths, as you call them. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, it's, it's as, not, long as, as long as we will try to understand or look at it with the glasses on with these isms which we understand of with other religions, we cannot understand Hinduism. We cannot understand the uh, power of assimilation of Hinduism. Like somebody said, Buddha is basically considered one of the avatars. Similarly, Jain Munis are all considered Hinduism. They even may not the people followers of those sects may not think oh we are hindus no and, they don't but for hindus it they have the same respect for jain munis they have same respect for buddha we have same respect for uh, uh, guru nanak or uh, that is the uh, strength of hindu uh, philosophy that, that, that's and just that. what the swami was pointing out yes that this that even the charvakas yes with their monstrous uh, materialism right which uh, well that's a whole other conversation about how uh, Adi Shankaracharya uh, somewhat subdued that the Charvakas yeah so anybody else anything else all right well we'll take it up there next week. Um, thank you all for coming this evening. Um, we'll just close with uh, 
what is so badly needed in the new world now. We'll, cl we'll close with our ancient prayer for peace as uh, translated by Swami Yogeshananda. Let there be peace in outer space. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth, and in the waters. Let there be peace in the herbs, the plants, and the trees. May the gods be peaceful. May the whole universe be pervaded by peace. Let this infinite universal peace prevail throughout my being. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beings everywhere. And we always close with the, the same chant we would chant if you were leaving from the parking lot. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ki Jai. Durga, Durga, Durga. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you be cheerful. May you have peace of mind. And may you go forward in the mother's loving and protective embrace. Mm. So that's the last class for this week until Saturday, in which time we'll take up uh, Realizing God, the collection of talks by Swami Prabhupada. And then on Sunday, and I hope you'll all join in on this, uh, on Sunday, we're having an open forum on Bhakti Yoga, the path of devotion, uh, in which we uh, can discuss among ourselves. It will be a facilitated discussion, but it will not be a lecture. And uh, attached to tomorrow's newsletter will be a worksheet in the form of a PDF that you can download or <coughs> simply uh, read uh, that uh, gives just some definitions of bhakti uh, and, the, and the bhakti, the devotional path, um, just as a starting point, but just that, not, not instruction, just, just that. So that's the rest of our week, Saturday and Sunday. And then uh, we'll crank it up again for another week. So until then, good night, everyone. So glad you could be with us. And the Swami said he'd strike us dumb. He'd frighten us uh, with, his, with his talk. Mm, I suspect there was, a, it, al it always shakes me reading this. You know, he's so emphatic and so, so strong in his language. So until next time, dear ones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.